just as you are, to worship you. Come, just as you are before your God. Church. My name is Jabe. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are uh, visiting with us on this Sunday, we do not always meet outside. Uh, we do have a building, and it's a rather beautiful building, and there's nothing wrong with it. But we are intentionally coming out here to uh, worship today in this camp meeting style uh, format as one congregation because we indeed are one congregation. Although we do meet at three separate times on Sunday at 8 15 at 9, 40, and 11, and so sometimes it does feel as if we do have three separate congregations, but this is not the truth. The truth is we are one. So thank you for being here today, friends. There was a rumor going around that the reason why we were doing this is because I wanted two services off. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm here to say that is not true. Uh, we truly are doing this just to be together. We have a wonderful meal afterwards. I've been inside and it smells so good and I know it's going to taste good and we're going to be blessed by it. Um, a couple other things real quick. If you are new, uh, we do have a welcome center inside and on that welcome center we have some coffee mugs and those mugs are a gift to you. Please stop by the welcome center, put your name on the clipboard and take home a mug and enjoy it on beautiful mornings like this one that we have today. Also, uh, for those of you who do receive communication uh, from the church through our weekly e-news, you would have noticed that there uh, was a plea from our youth this week uh, for the church to donate candy. They're doing this really cool event this year uh, over in uh, Southern Pines where we're going to do a trunk or treat. And to be able to make this trunk or treat happen, uh, we need candy. And so uh, please, and, oh, thank you, Alyssa. Yeah. And also costumes, gently used or new costumes. Bring those we're going to create a, a, a costume rack where the kids who come to the trunk or treat have the ability to shop for a free costume. So uh, gently use new costumes, candy. You'll see inside in the lobby area there is a donation bin. Please stop by and place something in that bin. Uh, Encanto is our movie on the lawn event. It happens real soon, real soon. Encanto here on the lawn, uh, you should be receiving correspondence about that. And many of you probably have a free ticket for Encanto in your program today. And again, if you don't have a program, raise your hand right now because you're going to need it. Nobody's raising their hand. We did good, guys. We did good. All right. So uh, you do not need that ticket to actually get in. It's just promotional, but you can give it to somebody else after you leave today, okay? And uh, we want to see the lawn just as full as it is today for that movie night as we come and do something fun together. And then, of course, there is the Pastors' Cup coming up in November. It's our golf tournament. Uh, I am the 
uh, the commissioner of that event this year to try to keep the integrity of the tournament intact. Uh, there are sign-up forms. I, yeah. Look, if you haven't watched the documentary yet, you need to. It, it takes it takes a lot of the, the, the questions and answers them. Um, please sign up for the Pastors' Cup. The sooner the better so that we can do planning with the golf club in terms of the meal. If you're a single, a double, uh, a threesome, or a full team, just sign up, and we want to have a great day in November. Uh, finally, a lot of effort went into this uh, today. We give thanks uh, for all those who have uh, made it possible. Uh, we give thanks to Tom and the Connections Band, uh, for the, the folks who helped set up the chairs, for the fellowship team, for those who are greeting and ushering today, uh, for all who made it possible. Um, we, we give God thanks. But in terms of the chairs set up, we have to get all these chairs and tables back inside after everybody gets done eating today. So if you are able and if you have the time to stick around until people get done, we would love to have your help to get the chairs and the tables uh, back inside, okay? All right. Um, let's worship together, friends. I'm going to invite my friend Mary Lou up, who's going to tell us a little bit about camp meetings. Jed. Actually, it's about camp meeting music. Around 1800, with the birth of the camp meetings, a new and distinctive type of song was developed. The frontier camp songs sprang from the frontier hearts. This type of music was introduced when the Methodists took over and spread it into Tennessee, Ohio, and the rest of the burgeoning West. The staid old hymns everyone was used to were too sedate to express the tumultuous enthusiasm of the crowds gathered in the tents and under the open sky. These songs were set to folk tunes, and the throngs of worshipers would often be caught up by the pulsating rhythms, emotional repetition, and jubilant refrains. The mighty choruses would roll through the forest clearings and sometimes a singing ecstasy would seize the worshipers. Eventually, these indigenous types of songs came to be printed in the simple camp meeting songbooks of the time. Most of the songs were preserved in the books, represented the second stage in camp meeting music, with the spirit intact, but much of the crudeness disappearing. This type of music appealed to sinners, backsliders, and even mourners, revealing their terms of salvation as they shared their personal experiences through their testimonials. These songs were often contagious, and it was sometimes said that they became the prayer of the penitent and the hallelujah of the redeemed. The music developed into what we now refer to as gospel music is the descendant of the camp meeting songs of the early 19th century, but in more refined form. It was evangelical in spirit and evangelistic in trying to win souls through conversions, primarily at the camp meetings that eventually used in Sunday schools. Southern gospel has infused rock music since 1960s. Over time, the well-known traditional church hymns that we all recognize, including the first two songs we will sing today, have been infused with a combination black gospel, country blues, and rock and roll, creating what is now contemporary praise music. Please join Tom and the Connections Praise Band as we celebrate today by singing our faith.
All hail the power. Our idea today was to bring new to the old. Here's a good example from Mr. Beethoven. scripture this morning. I was especially excited to find out it was a psalm, words written to music, a song. This is the last psalm, 150, and I want your help. I need a response. When I say praise him, you're going to respond and say praise, praise him. him. Very good. <laughs> you guys got this. So this is Psalm 150, the last psalm. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him. Praise in his mighty firmament. Praise him. Praise him. For his mighty deeds. Praise him. Praise him. To his surpassing greatness. 
Praise him. Praise With trumpet sound, praise him. Praise With lute and harp, praise him. Praise him. With tambourine and dance, praise him. Praise With strings and pipe, praise him. Praise With clanging cymbals, praise him. Praise him. With loud clashing cymbals, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Worshiping together in this sanctuary, this this great sanctuary that is greater than all sanctuaries, the great outdoors. God has blessed us with such a beautiful morning, blessed us with such a beautiful community to worship with. We give God thanks. And one of the ways that we give God thanks continually is through uh, continuing to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Here at Pinehurst United Methodist Church, we live by this idea that we cannot outgive our God. And so we have the opportunity to uh, give back once again now through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I'm calling our ushers forward at this time.
about 10 years ago when I started here with various things and uh, Roger Hicks and playing with concerts. And then uh, Roger retired and uh, I somehow ended up continuing to play concerts. And then when it was decided to have a, a uh, contemporary service, I was asked to, to join in that too. And then shortly after that, there was the first combined service at the Fair Park. And we did a song that just seemed to fit the day. Since then, we've done it several times whenever we have combined services or that opportunity. And so it seems fitting that this particular piece should become our unity song. That's why I call it unity song. The title is Our Church. We hope you'll enjoy this and feel part of this group. song Tom perfect how good is it to be worshiping outside and you do not have to tune your radio station to a certain frequency <laughs> to be able to hear the music and the preaching 
Yeah, amen, right? A lot of you have been around here since those days, uh, those days that uh, COVID forced the church into uh, having to worship in new, creative, and innovative ways through Card Church. It's so good to be out here on the lawn and to be able to, to pass the peace of Christ with one another uh, by actually greeting one another in the flesh. Uh, I don't know how you guys did it. I wasn't here for that. Did you honk horns or... <laughs> Instead of beep, beep, let's greet one another with uh, a, a nice handshake or fist bump or whatever you feel comfortable doing this morning. Let's pass the peace. this crowd back. This <laughs> is what we want. You can, you can pass more peace if you want to. I'm not going to be the one preventing you from getting lunch on time. It's going to be yourself. Most of you sat back down. I'm going to ask you to actually stand back up. <laughs> In all seriousness, it is important that uh, we do use our voices to affirm what it is that we believe. And I know this is a traditional element, and some of our Connections folks may not be so familiar uh, with the Apostles' Creed, and that's okay. We're not uh, we're not intending to make you feel any less than by by saying it. It's just a creed that's been agreed upon in the church for uh, centuries, and so it's important that um, it is said. So if you're not saying it, at least let the words uh, fall on you as we affirm what it is we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day, for the opportunity to gather together in a new way to worship as one church. We pray for those who want to be here but cannot be. We pray for those who are dealing with illness, cancer, 
various types of health problems. We lift them up to you this day in the confidence of knowing that you are already at work in each and every situation. And as we gather together outside this day, God, we also pray for this community, for this county. We pray that all in this area can have quality of life. We ask that if your church can do anything to increase that quality, that you would make it plain for us that you would enable and empower and equip us to do what we need to do. Help us to be a beacon of hope. We pray for all those who keep us safe. We pray for our military, our first responders. We do pray for your church. On this piece of holy ground and in all places on holy ground. God, we pray that we would have the ability to see all things that exist as holy. As it all belongs to you. Now with the confidence of the children of God, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Nothing else can take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, bring me back to you.
preached, um, I preached, I don't know how many revival slash camp meeting sermons before. Um, it's been a lot. This is actually the first one under a tent, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, I like it. I like it. One of the uh, the things about a, a camp meeting um, or a revival, depending on which term you uh, you prefer, um, I think we somewhat intentionally chose not to use the, the term revival here because um, we're full speed ahead and not in need of a lot of reviving. Uh, there's not a lot of dead stuff around PUMC that needs reviving, so this is more of a camp meeting uh, as opposed to revival. But um, John Wesley, you know, started preaching outside at one point in his ministry, uh, and he actually framed it as he was submitting to be more vile, <coughs> submitting to be more vile by going and preaching outside. I don't know how vile you feel this morning. It kind of feels right. Um, so I'm glad that you're here. I always like to tell this, this story about a revival. There was uh, a preacher going to preach at this, this church. They were having their annual revival out under the tent. And the visiting preacher came in, and the, the host preacher said to him, said, I want you to know that when you do the altar call, because that's something that typically happens in, in revivals, uh, when you do your altar call, I want you to, to know that Brother Johnson is going to come from the back. And he's going to be pounding on his chest and pulling at his clothes. And he's going to be making this terrible noise of lament and whine, saying, save me, Lord, save me, save me, me, a poor sinner. And he said, I want you to know that he does this each and every night, each and every year, at each and every revival. And I also want you to know <coughs> that when it's over, he goes home, and he's the same honorary, mean, <laughs> unpleasant person as he was prior to the altar call. And so the preacher preaches, and it calls for the altar call, and sure enough, there comes Brother Johnson from the back, pulling on his clothes, beating his chest, whining, saying, please, God, forgive me, have mercy on this sinner, so on and so forth. And so he's up there with a few others who come to the altar call, and the visiting preacher starts his prayer over Brother Johnson and the others. And he says, Dear Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gathered around this altar. And then he went and he put his hand on top of Brother Johnson's head. He said, Except for this one, Lord, because he leaks a little. <laughs> We're all a bit leaky. That's why we keep coming back. Today's scripture comes from John's Gospel. It's chapter 11. It's a familiar story to many of us who have been around the church for a while. It is the story of Jesus' friend Lazarus and his death. I'm reading selected verses. I'm not reading the whole entire story. But most of it. I'm reading verses 1 through 7 and then 17 through 35. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, acting after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. 
When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, Praise thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me, please? God, we ask that in this preaching moment, we hear a, at least one thing, at least one thing that transforms us because we have experienced you through that hearing. We ask that your preacher be nothing more than just a vessel, an instrument of your grace. It's through Christ that we pray. Amen. Lord, if you had only been here, Lord, if you would have been here. Martha and Mary's words, they, they resonate with, with us. Any of us who have ever experienced tragedy, severe heartbreak, the death of someone that we love, we get where they're coming from. Lord, If you would have been here. Martha and Mary, they, they lament. They, they both cry out the exact same cry in separate encounters with Jesus. Lord, Jesus, if you would have been here. If you would have been here, my brother would still be alive. Where were you? We sent word. You had plenty of time to get here. Why the delay? Then you hear our cries for help. Why didn't you get here, Lord? If you had only been here. I'm 
willing to bet that, that for many of us gathered here today, we've said those words. If not those words, then, then something kind of like it. And if we haven't said it, then we've experienced times in life where we've less, at least thought about these words. In times of trial, and in times of tragedy, in times of death. Lord, if you would have been here. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would still be alive. Lord, if you would have been here, my mother would still be alive. Lord, if you would have been here, my friend would still be alive. Lord, if you would have been here, my spouse would still be alive. Lord, if you would have been here, to be sure, Jesus... Jesus hears our cries of lament just as he heard uh, Martha and Mary's cries that day. Their brother Lazarus, who was also a close friend of Jesus, he, he had become ill. And Martha and Mary, uh, they are extremely close friends of Jesus as well, and they ask for Jesus to come to Lazarus' aid, to come to his rescue. You see, Martha and Mary knew they had witnessed what Jesus was capable of. They knew that he had the power. They knew that he had the authority to make Lazarus better. And so they send for him in, in what is a, a desperate plea. But he doesn't show up. He doesn't show up, and, and Lazarus' breath gives out. His body expires. So his family, they, they prepare his body for burial. Then they place him in a tomb. His lifeless body takes residence in the tomb where it remains for four days. Four days prior to Jesus' arrival. Four days. Four days later. Four days too late. When Jesus shows up, Martha and then Mary both say the same thing that we would have said in that situation. They both say uh, the same thing that many of us have said or will say or at least the thing that we have thought or will think. Lord, if you would have only been here. But Jesus isn't oblivious to their pain. Jesus isn't numbed by the four days that has passed. Jesus hears the cries of the sisters. Jesus not only sees the pain that is expressed through their tears, but he feels the pain that they feel. This is his friend who lay lifeless in a tomb. These are his friends weeping still four days later. These are his people. The pain of their grief and the pain of his own grief moves Jesus to the point of shedding tears of his own. Here we have God incarnate, fully divine, fully human, standing near the tomb of his friend, weeping. John 11, verse 35, in most translations, is the shortest verse of scripture in the entire Bible. It's just two words. One verse, only two words. But these are two words that reveal to us a very important thing about the character of God. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. One little verse. Those two words, they tell us so much about the God of it all. Jesus wept. Whenever Lazarus died, God's heart was the first heart to break. Whenever any of God's beloved die, God's heart is the first to break. Jesus wept. And Jesus weeps. And it is precisely 
because death is contrary to the ultimate will of God that Jesus decides to do something about it. In the case of Lazarus, Jesus refuses to let death have the final say. In the case of Lazarus, Jesus says, not today, death. You are not a thing that's going to keep this beloved body in the ground. So Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, and he makes a statement, a statement that, that, that should cause us to feel a little bit of a, of a flutter. <laughs> As we imagine Jesus saying it, we, we, we should feel a little something. You see, because standing there with the stone lying at the entrance of a cave, a stone that had been rolled in front of Lazarus's tomb with dried up tears in his eye ducts, Jesus says, take away the stone. Take away the stone, he says. But Martha says, but Lord, there is already a stench. There is already a stench, his sister says. His body, long dead, had already begun the process of decay, and it had a stench. But Jesus says, take away the stone. And then Jesus says a prayer, and then another powerful statement from the one who all things come into being through. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man emerges. His, his, his body that had once expired, it, it reanimates. But make no mistake about it, this is no zombie. This is no walking dead. This is a man who has been brought back to life with the utterance of some words by the author of life. Lazarus emerges from the tomb, bound in his burial clothes, and Jesus says, unbind him, set him free, let him go. Unbind him, set him free, let him go. And he does. Thanks be to God. But you see, one of the challenges for us, for us, those who are categorized as those who believe yet they have not seen, one of the challenges for us is that we watch people die and stay dead all the time. We have many situations in life where we, we continue to say or to at least think, Lord, if, if you would have only been here, but we never hear anything in return. We go and visit graveyards and, and tombs and, and, and memorial gardens. And our loved ones, they, they, they do not emerge. We do not hear those words, those life-giving words, unbind them, set them free, let them go. Take the stone away. But you best believe, as those who believe yet have not seen, you best believe that those words of life are being uttered by the author of life on our behalf and on behalf of all those we know and love. And the reason why I can say that with such confidence is because that one stone was taken away that one time. Because that one stone was taken away that one time, the stones have been rolled away for all times. But we're not talking about the stone of Lazarus this time. We're talking about the stone of Jesus' tomb. It is precisely because death is contrary to the ultimate will of God that Jesus decides to do something about it once and for all. The stone has been rolled away. Death has been defeated. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, friends, death has been defeated. This we believe, this we profess, this we experience in little ways on this side of the dirt. This we are yet to experience in big and little ways in what is still to come. Friends, life 
wins. Life wins. And so it's okay for us in the meantime to say, Lord, if you would have been here, it's totally okay to say it. One day somebody's going to be saying it on your behalf. Just know that, that, that whenever it is said, whenever it is said, Jesus, with, with tears still in his tear ducts, with holes in his hands and a hole in his side, whenever it is said, Lord, if you would have only been here, Jesus is whispering back, it's okay, I've been there. I've been there before. I know the way out. I am the way out. I hold the keys. Come on and follow me. Follow me to life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I have Tom and the, the band come back up. I know to this point we've all been uh, seated, but I want to ask you as you are able in response to this proclamation of the word, on this camp meeting Sunday that you stand and sing this, this wonderful praise song with us. And uh, Tom, after saying that praise, uh, after we do this, this praise song, I'm going to come back up and do a closing prayer and benediction, and Tom's going to have some instructions about lunch. Please stay and eat. We have plenty of food. We've been preparing for this day. Um, we today celebrate the fact that life wins. Life wins, friends. We have been unbound. We have been set free. Jesus has said, let them go and let them live. We are not zombies. We are not the walking dead. We are very much fully alive. Thanks be to God. Who am I?
Thanks be to God, life wins. And friends, there will be a day that, that comes later on down the road. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's coming one day when we are going to be face to face with the one who has made the victory possible. But until that time, we still have the ability to witness resurrection on a daily basis. We just have to have the ability to see it. Friends, I pray that God gives us the vision that we need to see it clearly. You are a child of God, and you are loved. Let this be the prayer for the meal, too. Don't wait on me to come over there and pray again. That's not going to happen. Eat today and taste the goodness of the food, and know that you are loved by God and by this church. Go in peace, friends. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right.